Hello, this is Elisa Rodriguez, and this is the Arian Orthodox Church. This is Arianism Today. So today we are going to be talking about Michael the Archangel and trying to dispel some misunderstandings that people have about Arianism and how a lot of people want to just automatically assume that Arianism, because it is so similar to Jehovah's Witnesses, that they want to assume that we are and view Jesus the same way and that we assume that Michael and Jesus are the same person. And that's just entirely not true. And so my attempt today is to show you the Arian view of Michael the Archangel, who Michael the Archangel is and why Michael the Archangel is not Jesus. And that is our attempt today. And so, <clears throat> to begin with, Michael uh, means who is like God. And when you listen to that, you could read it a couple of ways. The, the word Michael could mean who is like God. Like, who is like God? Like, there's no one else that's like God. Kind of in that sense. Or, you could read it as though it means who is like God. Like, saying that Michael is like God, that this person is like God. Um, and so that is going to help perpetuate this misunderstanding. Um, we know that anyone's name in Hebrew only means what it means. It doesn't mean that they are God in any sense or that this meaning has anything to do with them per se. Um, Hezekiah means mighty God. Um, Elijah means uh, Sovereign Lord. El Eliseo, my name, means uh, God is my salvation. It doesn't mean any more than, than that. It doesn't mean that I'm the God of salvation. It doesn't mean that my son's uh, the Sovereign Lord. Uh, his middle name is Adonai. It doesn't mean that he is, you know, the Sovereign Lord Adonai. It's just a name. So when you see Michael, it means who is like God. It means there's no one. It's a rhetorical question. There's no one like God. That's that's the sense of the word. If you read too much into it, then these are the things, you know, you're going to come into some error. So the first time that we see Michael the archangel is in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. And it says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now, <clears throat> let's, for anyone who doesn't know this verse, uh, this is Gabriel who is telling this story, the angel Gabriel. And when you read in the beginning here, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, it is not talking about an actual human prince of the kingdom of Persia. That the angel Michael went and had a battle with because somehow a human was able to withstand or hold back an angel from delivering a message to Daniel. That's not what's happening. No human can really stop an angel from delivering a message. Their spiritual being where, you know, uh, humans don't have that ability. <coughs> but the prince of the kingdom of Persia is what is called a territorial demon. In other words, a demon who is in control of a kingdom or territory. And that he is a high-ranking demon that is in charge of a certain area. And then it's saying that this demon was the one who was holding back and battling with Gabriel on his way to send a message. 21 days worth of battling. So Gabriel was trying to get through and send a message out for 21 days. And this demon, this territorial demon, was preventing him to. So this is a spiritual realm battle. This is a battle in the spiritual realm. And so Michael comes and he is one of the chief princes, it says. And came to help me for I had been there uh, left with the kings of Persia. Now he wasn't, my, you know, Michael I'm sorry, Gabriel wasn't stuck with actual human kings of Persia, but even higher demons in the rankings over the territorial demons who were 
in charge of that uh, spiritual realm. So we, the understanding is not that humans are preventing angels from doing stuff, but that these are demons who are being controlled, uh, who are trying to prevent angels of God from delivering messages and doing their job. <coughs> so the important part that we need to see here is that um, the word prince here, the word prince here does not mean a child in royalty. The, the, the territorial demon is called prince and Michael is called one of the chief princes. And so we have to understand the demon is not a prince of any royal line and neither is Michael because that's not the meaning of the word. Um, <clears throat> and we can look at this uh, a little a little more closely by looking at the word itself. This is the word in Hebrew for prince. Um, the word prince appears in the Bible 130 times. Um, it is 86 times it does not mean royalty. Okay, an heir to a royal throne or anything like that. It means a leader. So prince means a leader. Um, so 80, 86, what is it? Um, 86 times out of 130, it's leader. Um, and then, let me see where my facts are here. And then 38 times it's used as prince. And then only six times is it used uh, for ruler. And so prince, the sense of the word prince, in, and honestly, it's only in Ezekiel 37 times and one time in the book of Genesis is it used for, uh, in that sense, prince. And so when we're looking at the description that's being given at Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, when it's talking about this demon being a prince of the kingdom of Persia, he's not in some sort of royal line in the actual human line of Persia, but he's a leader. He's a demonic leader over the territory. And when it's talking about Michael being a chief prince and one of the chief princes, it's talking about Michael being one of the leaders, and that's his role as a leader in the defense of the interests of God in Israel and the Israeli people. So that is the sense of the word. So what people who believe that Jesus and Michael are the same person see this word prince and they don't care that the word is being used for a demon here, uh, a territorial demon. They don't care, you know, necessarily why the demon is called a prince also. Um, and then we've just looked at the proof to where it does, it can mean just leader. Um, and so it could be uh, the leader of the kingdom of Persia, talking about a spiritual leader, uh, and talking about a demonic leader. And then you have Michael, one of the chief leaders, came to help him, talking about Gabriel. That's the sense of the word that you should find out, that you should see that that's what it's saying. And it's not saying that Jesus, I'm sorry, that that um, Michael is Jesus and that he is the prince of the, the, the Father God, right? That God the Father on his throne, that, G, that Michael is this um, prince, that he is a prince for that reason. Um, and so then on top of that, we have to look at Michael being called one of the chief princes. Um, and so he is a, he is one of, um, a, uh, a certain more than one number of princes. And so these leaders, he's a chief leader, but there are obviously other chief leaders because he is one of a variety, an unknown number of other leaders. And so the problem with that in, uh, in that what we need to understand why it's a problem is because Jesus is called an only begotten son only begotten God, it says here in John chapter 1, verse 18. And so 
Michael is being characterized as being one of a variety of leaders. And if you want to take the word prince and take it in its most literal sense and say that he is one of the princes, um, then you have to explain why Jesus is said to be the only begotten God, only born God, the only born son of God, and why Ma uh, Michael is one of a bunch of princesses. And so there is a difference there. And we know that, you know, the argument can come up that um, Isaac is called the only begotten son of Abraham, and that because you know, Abraham actually did have Isaac also, that he's not technically the only begotten son. But I think in the sense of God saying that Abraham was going to have a child by promise, and Ishmael was not the, the child of promise, and pretty much kicked Ishmael out of his family line, um, and pretty much just divorced him or got rid of him, tossed him out. Um, Isaac was left to be the only begotten son of Abraham because he's the only begotten son of a promise. So regardless of how you want to look at it, he is the only begotten son of this promise. And so Jesus is the only begotten son of that is made directly by God. So we're going to look at the differences between, uh, because if Michael is called one of the chief princes, then it means that he's not an only begotten child. Um, and so that speaks of other princesses. And then so the argument would be that angels are called sons of God in the book of Genesis. Angels are called sons of God in um, Psalms 82 possibly could be judges, um, but it's it's happened before when the devil came up in the book of Job and uh, the sons of God were there as well. This sense. <coughs> and so I think in this sense of the word, we have to look at and kind of scrutinize something that we don't normally get to teach on. And I'm glad that I'm able to teach on it today is that when you think about in Luke, the first Adam is called the Son of God. And then Jesus is called the only begotten Son, or the only, only begotten God. And in John chapter 1, Jesus is said to give us the power to become sons. Now, something I want you all to think about. If Adam is called the son of God already without Jesus. And then Jesus is giving us the power to become sons of God through him, through him, through Christ. We can become sons of God. There are two senses of the word son of God here. Adam, in the book of Luke, is obviously not the same kind of son of God that Jesus is. And so we have to look at if God has created you through Jesus, then it's not wrong to say that he is your father. And it's not wrong for God to say that you're his children. He made you. So in some sense, we are all children of God. But God created Jesus directly. In other words, he didn't use Jesus to create Jesus. God on his own, by himself, made Jesus. And so the only created being who is made directly from God, the only thing to have come into existence directly from God without any mediator is Jesus. And so in that sense, Jesus is the only born, only begotten Son of God, because God himself created him alone. And so everything else that exists 
has come into existence through Jesus. Although God gave him the power and those things are done by the command of God and God is actually the ultimate source of even Jesus' existence, all things exist because God the Father is the creator, but he decided to use Jesus as the avenue through which everything else is created. Now, if God created everything individually, directly, so if God created Jesus and then God created the earth alone without Jesus, then that's another sense where everything else is made directly from God, then everything else can be said to be brothers and sisters of Christ because they are all made directly from God. But because God only created one thing like that, which is Jesus, Jesus is the only one born literal child of God. Now, God did create all these other things through Christ, but they're not in the same sense as literal a child as Jesus is. And so this is why Jesus is called the only begotten God, because the Father is an unbegotten God. He's an always existing God. And his Son is an only begotten God because God made him. He didn't always exist, and then he came into existence. And so therefore, Jesus is different than everyone else. Okay? Different than everyone else. So yes, everyone is a child of God, but not in the same sense that Jesus is. Jesus is in a special, unique position that's different from everyone else. And so he has no brothers and sisters. He has no equals. There are no other princes to the degree that he is. So it's kind of like seeing adopted children, and then you have your actual, literal, biological child. You may have a lot of adopted children or a lot of children who are not per se your biological children, but you treat them and see them as your children, that's one thing. But if they are actually your actual child, it's different. They are biologically yours. And so in this sense, Jesus is the only biologically biological child of God. Everything else is made through Jesus, and so therefore they're not the same. And so when Michael is called one of the chief princes, it's not consistent with who the Bible is explaining Jesus as. It's not consistent. Michael is one of a group of princes, whether you want to take that in the literal royal sense of the word, or if you want to take it as leader, Jesus has no equal, and Michael has an unknown number of equals that he is one of. So that in and of itself should give us understanding that Jesus and Michael are different in that sense. No one has ever, before Jesus, called us friends and brethren or brothers. Before that, because we are becoming part of Christ and becoming coming into existence through Christ, we're coming children of God through Christ, uh, therefore, he's calling us brothers. But it's not the same way with everything else. And so this is something that we have to look at. When God had Adam and he wanted to make more humans, he didn't make another new line of humans to, for Adam to procreate with. He used the one human and he divided him and made more through this one Adam. So he made a wife. They had children, and then multiplication happened. They were fruitful and multiplied. So this is how God used the one Adam and multiplied and made a whole species of humans, right? Children and generations and all of that. But he used the same one because if it was a different one, then it wouldn't be the same as the very first one. And so that's why God brought Jesus in to be the last Adam, a new line of humanity, because the sinful line, the Adam line, was sinful and had problems. Um, God created a new line of human so that all of us can jump on that line of human and therefore become 
children of God because that's who Jesus is. And so we're jumping lines from the first Adam to the last Adam, and we're becoming children, literal children of God because God is using Jesus. And just like he split Adam and created Eve, and then they had were fruitful and multiplied, that's what's happening with Jesus. Through Jesus, the last Adam, we're coming into this line. We're becoming the body of Christ. And then God's going to take his bride out of his body and is going to use Jesus to multiply or give us our identities. And so we're all going to be hidden in the identity of Christ because all of us are going to be part of Christ. His one child that he made, that is literal child of God that's made directly by God, God is transplanting from the first line of Adam and putting us into the, the last Adam and therefore creating more children through this one only begotten child. And therefore, we're not begotten in the same way, but we are being made out of this one begotten child. So Jesus will always be the only begotten child and we are being taken out of the only begotten. So we're not being begotten, we're being fashioned out of. So it's different. Jesus will always be the only begotten literal child of God, and we are going to be literal, as literal children of God as Jesus is, but none of us were begotten that way. We started in a different form and became that. So in this sense, we have to understand that Michael is not the same way. Michael is made through Jesus and is not in the same sense a child of God and in that same sense and that's kind of why everyone is kind of amazed at what God is doing by getting these this dust of the ground and creating and making more, us to the elevated point of being actual children of God so Jesus is the whole point of that is that Jesus is the only begotten son of God and he has no equals even when we're made through him we're not technically equal because he is the only one begotten this way and the rest of us are being fashioned out of him. It's different. Um, and so there are no equals to Jesus. And Michael is said to be one of the chief princes. And so that's what you have to look at. See that one of the chief princes. And so the identity already on the first verse is already obvious that Jesus and Michael are not consistent with each other. So the next place we see is in Daniel chapter 10, verse 21. It says, However, I will tell you the, uh, what is inscribed in the writing of truth, yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. So it says that it calls Michael your prince to, um, to the Israelite people, that Michael is your prince. Now, if you want to take it that it, it means prince, you have to at least acknowledge that it does could also mean leader. And in this sense, when I'm reading this, it's saying that, that Michael is your leader, a leader in defense of you. So he is the guardian angel of you, is the sense that I'm getting here, that he's the leader, he's an influence, he's an authority. He is for your protection, but not necessarily as a worshipped as the Messiah. And so that, that's why its meaning is that he's a guardian angel, that he is on guard, that his job is as a, as a bodyguard, essentially. And so what, we're, what they're failing to understand is that they're looking at the bodyguard and saying, you are my savior, when in reality, um, it's, it's a function of his job, but he's not the savior. He's not the Messiah. And so that's what he is. It's saying that he is, and this is the way I'm reading it, that he is a guardian angel, that he is a bodyguard or, a, a, you know, the, the head of your personal private protection. Um, so then we look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and we see confirmation that Michael is a guard. He is a he is a guardian angel, not the Messiah, and that his role is as guard protection. He is your bodyguard. He is your 
you know, private protection team. He is your security team. He is the head of, you know, the secret service for the nation of Israel in the spiritual realm. And so <clears throat> we're seeing confirmation that the sense of the word is that Michael is the great leader who stands guard over the sons of your people. When you read it that way, you understand the actual sense of the word and not that he is a part of royalty, okay? Um, because we have to look back and see if that's the case, then why are the demons part of royalty and what royal family are they from um, in, in that kind of sense? And we know that obviously the father is not their royal. They're not heirs to the throne of God. The demons aren't. And so we can't take it that way for them. And so it's it's conceivable that we shouldn't take it that way for Michael. It's just a, the way we need to look at these things. So now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands out guard over the sons of your people will arise. And um, and this is going to be where people start seeing the messianicness of Michael. It says, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, uh, whoever is written in the book of life, will be rescued. And so they're seeing that Michael is going to arise. Ooh, you know, he's, he's, he's going to arise. But what is his function? It already talks about that he's, he's a guard, that he is a leader, he is an influence, he's an authority of protection. We can see the, 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 the actions that he's done in the previous two verses and how he's protecting Gabriel from sending, you know, to send the message that he's supposed to. His job is obviously as protection, as, as a force of God's authority to battle demonic forces for the interests of God in Israel and with the Israeli people. Now, when you see that he will arise, this is a chronological, this is a prophecy. And so this is what's happening. The prophecy is saying what's going to happen in chronological order, that, that there's going to be a point when Michael arises. What is he going to do when he arises? He's going to battle the devil. And there will be uh, a tribulation, the distress. That's what's going to happen after the fact. So there's going to be war in heaven, and then there's going to be this tribulation after the fact. And then everyone who's found written in the book of life will be risk rescued. None of this is insinuating that Michael is the one who's doing this. It's just telling you that this is the order. There's going to be war in heaven, and then there's going to be this tribulation, and then after that, the 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 everyone who's written in the book of life will be rescued. That's what's the order of what we're reading here. And then after that, the next verse says, and many of those who sleep in the dust and ground will awaken. Now it's talking about resurrection. These to everlasting life and others to disgrace or everlasting contempt. So now we're seeing that they're talking about resurrection. So before there was Michael arises and then there's this tribulation and then there's this you know, say, salvation for those who are written in the, in the book of life, and then there's resurrection here, and then some of them are going to hell and some of them are going to heaven. This is a super condensed version of what the book of Revelations looks like. This is a, such a super condensed version of what I see in what it looks like in the book of Revelations. So <coughs> that's why I'm saying that I see a chronological order into what the story is and that it's not necessarily saying that Michael is the catalyst or the reason why all of these things are happening, but that during this time, Michael's going to do something and then there's this tribulation and then there's other stuff and going on to the end where the, you know, everyone is either sent to the lake of fire or are, are saved and are going to be in, in the new heaven and the new earth. It's a condensed version. It's a super condensed version, but that's exactly the way the chronology that I see in the book of Revelations. Now, I think there is some some tribulation ahead of that uh, of of uh, Revelations 12. We're going to look at Revelations 12, but in in context, that the last part of the 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 tribulation is really really amazing, um, and and uh, and so there's there's some important parts there that we can't skip over. Um, about the tribulation. So 
if we look at Revelation chapter 12, because I'm telling you that that's what that verse means, and not necessarily it's talking about, you know, Michael being the reason why, we're going to look at this super duper condensed version of the gospel. Okay? The entire story of the gospel is in this one verse. It says, she gave birth to a male child. That's Jesus coming into the world as a, as a human. Uh, one who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. That's Jesus. But her child was caught up to God. It totally skips the entire ministry of Jesus and says, he's caught up to God and to his throne. Talking about when Jesus has, you know, is asked to sit at the right hand of the Father. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she is placed and prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Okay. So, that's Jesus coming, becoming flesh, dying, going up to heaven, and sitting at the right hand of the Father. The next thing you see, um, hold on here, let's see here. Oh, that's both of them. And so the next thing you see is, let's see if I can get it. <coughs> so the next thing you see is, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war. So, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and you have to understand what the Scripture says about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. So, it says here in Mark sixteen nineteen. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So after he talked to the disciples, he went straight up into heaven, did his ministry, you know, offered his blood, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Okay, he sat at the right hand of God. Now, if he's sitting at the right hand of God, why is he sitting at the right hand of God? And so we need to look at this other scripture. This is uh, Psalms 110. It says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Who is speaking? It says, The Lord, Yahweh, right? So Yahweh says to Adoni, which is the Messiah. So Yahweh says to Adoni, sit at my right hand, right hand of God, right hand of the Father, until I, who's the I? Yahweh, the Father, until the Father makes your enemies a footstool for your feet. So the Father is supposed to make the um, the enemies of Jesus the footstool, not Jesus. And so it says, The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion and rule in the midst of your enemies and keep going and keep going. And, and at the verse 4, you are the priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We know this is Jesus. <coughs> and so now, the role of Jesus is after he gets to heaven, to do what? To sit at the right hand of God and let God himself take care of his enemies. So as soon as, when we're looking in Revelations chapter 12, so as soon as we see she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule with the, uh, uh, all nations with the rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled. So that's Jesus dying and right, and going up to God and sitting on his throne. It says right after that, right here in verse 7, Now war arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels fighting. What's happening? Jesus went up to heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. And the Father said, I will make your enemies a footstool. So what's the first thing that happens after Jesus sits down at the right hand of the Father? Michael goes and starts war in heaven against the devil. So if Michael is the ark, I'm sorry, is the Messiah, then he has no job 
to do besides sit at the right hand of the Father. If, G if Michael is the Messiah, then he should be sitting at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the Father to send his forces to make his enemies his footstool. Earth is the footstool. And so if you look, he's sending, God the Father is sending Michael to go fight this war. While Jesus is sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father. And so that's what's happening. And so when all the demons are placed on earth and are confined and cornered on earth, the footstool, that's where they lay until judgment. And so, <coughs> and so what are we seeing here? That Jesus can't, that, that Michael the Archangel cannot be Jesus. Michael the Archangel is absolutely out of his element if he were. Because as we showed before, Psalms 110, it says, sit at my right hand. God the Father is saying, sit at my right hand to Jesus until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I make a footstool. I make your enemies a footstool. That means that the Father is the one who is in charge of getting that done. And obviously, God the Father doesn't have to go. He sends his legions of angels to go take care of this situation. And so Jesus, what is his job? What is he supposed to do? Sit at my right hand. That's what the Father said to Jesus. Sit at my right hand. You know, you died for, you know, you, you followed my orders. You died for me. You died at my request. For these people, you did your job. I appreciate it. Come sit down at the right at my right hand, and I'm going to take care of the rest. And he sends Michael the archangel to start the war in heaven. So, what are we seeing? We're seeing that Jesus and Michael's identities are different, because Michael is doing the Father's bidding. And he's fulfilling the Father's promise to Jesus. So let's read it again. Sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And he, who's the first thing that he sends right after Jesus? In the book of Revelations, it says, He goes up to heaven and sits at the throne on the throne. What does it say? Right afterwards, verse 7 of chapter 12. So chapter 12, verse 7. This is 6. This is 5 and 6. It says, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. That's when he died and rose again and was caught up to God and to his throne. So he's at the right hand of the Father. Verse 7, Now war arose in heaven and Michael and his angels. Exactly. Exactly. They're two different people. They're not the same. They're not the same. So um, let's see here. And so, let's move on here. So, the last verse that we need to look at here says, "For the this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet him in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Okay. And so, the people who want to make this connection between Jesus and Michael see this archangel um, comment and want to say that that this is proof that somehow Jesus is making some sort of archangel call or something. Um, but what's really happening here is the old Jewish marriage tradition where you know a couple gets engaged they write uh, um, a covenant a marriage covenant um, and if you if you guys should st probably study this because it has a lot to do with um, this entire story even in the book of revelations the marriage feast the um, a, a whole lot of stuff about jesus so it's really good to look into this marriage tradition to get a lot of revelation about what's really happening in the new testament but um, so the, the marriage tradition is, is that after they sign this marriage covenant, 
the 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 man goes and and takes off and goes to his father's house and starts building a place for his wife and him to live at their home at his father's house and so this is kind of uh, reminiscent of when jesus says i go to prepare a place for you in my father's house or many mansions if it were not so i would have told you uh, I, if i'm going to you know prepare this place i'm going to be back i'm going to come get you all of these promises are part of what you know a husband in this marriage in this in this uh, marriage covenant would say to his wife hey i'm going to leave i'm going to go make this place and you be ready when i come back to come get you and so while he's off building this thing and it from what i understand it took about a year to build this addition to their house for them to live in um, the woman is gathering together things that she's going to want to take to her new home. And she's got her wedding dress ready. She's got her bags packed. She's got her, you know, how she wants to do things. I mean, she's got all, all her new wardrobe or whatever, wh whatever her plans are and the material that she has. And she's just to be always ready for him to show up at any time to do this. And so this guy is going to start building and building and building and the this husband doesn't know when he's able to go and retrieve his wife until his father says you know what you did a great job this is absolutely finished go get your bride bring her home and consummate the marriage because they haven't seen each other for a year or whatever the husband's married to her and he's i'm sure ready to consummate the marriage he wants to get this started so he's waiting for the father to tell him you're ready to go this is this is a perfect place and so same thing with jesus jesus doesn't know the day or the hour when he's just supposed to come back because he doesn't know when the new heaven and the new earth and the new jerusalem and everything that he's constructing over here in the new universe is going to be ready but when it's ready the father's going to say jesus it's done let's go get your ride and at that point <coughs> Jesus isn't going to waste any time. He's going to get on that horse and he's going to get out there and start regulating on everything. Same thing with the husband. He's going to go and come back. Well, <coughs> the tradition is, is that the best man and his friends are going to go out there and start blowing shofars and saying the bridegroom cometh and all of this and make, you know, singing songs and all of that. And depending on how far away she lived, um, everybody knows she's getting married and everybody knows who they're, who they're coming and they're saying the bridegroom's coming. You know, everybody's seeing this and they're like, oh, it's time. And they're all running to her house faster than, you know, these bridegrooms are going because they're going to be taking their time. I'm sorry, um, these, uh, these best men are doing uh, because they're going to be taking their time because they want her to be ready. Well, everyone else is running faster than they are trying to get to the bride and saying, hey, your, your, your husband is coming to get you. Tonight's the night, you know, get ready. Um, and so she's got to start getting dressed and have all of her bags packed. All the girls, depending on whether it's dawn or daytime or whatever, um, have to get their lamps together and all of this stuff. And that's kind of that, that, that parable about, you know, half of them didn't have enough lanterns to wait for the bridegroom to come and some of them had enough oil and all of that so when they come so when they come they you know the ones who have light can follow them all the way back to the house <clears throat> and the ones who don't have to leave and then miss the entire arrival and try to find out where the house is and knock on the door and the door's not going to open because the party's already started and you're late so these these guys are saying, thus saith the Lord, and they're announcing and announcing and announcing that, that, that the bridegroom is coming so that the bride can be ready. And so in this verse, it's talking about this very thing, that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, not his shout, but the shout of the voice of the archangel who is saying, here comes Jesus, you know what I mean? I mean, here comes Hosanna, you know what I mean? And it, Blessed be the one who is coming in the name of the Lord. Jesus is coming, you know, this kind of thing. He's proclaiming this awesome event that's actually happening that everyone's been waiting for. And we know that Jesus is going to appear in the clouds on a white horse, you know, with his, um, you know, with 
you know, Lord of Lords and King of Kings written on him. And there's going to be an entire legion of army of angels up there, uh, a whole host of heavenly angels up there. And I can imagine the picture being absolutely amazing that these, you know, this archangel, whoever it may be, it doesn't necessarily say that it's Michael, but whoever it is, you know, crying out loud, declaring that Jesus is coming and looking up and seeing everyone kind of sitting there, you know, and Jesus uh, on the clouds. So it's an amazing picture, but it's the archangel who is supposed to go before and make this announcement ahead of him so that when he comes, everybody sees it. And so, um, and so this is the point that this is, you know, the trumpet of God. So God has his trumpets going um, and making. So there's an absolute racket being made of joy because this is the, you know, this is Jesus coming for his bride. And so the story here, when they read it, they're reading that Jesus's voice is that of an archangel. And that's absolutely not what's being said. What's being said is that Jesus is coming with the voice of the archangel who is going ahead of him, calling out and letting everyone know, here comes Jesus. He's coming for his bride. He's coming for his church. Everybody who doesn't like this, beware. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. The trumpet of God is going. It's an amazing time. And so that's what you need to understand from this. Not that Jesus is coming down and shouting like a archangel. It's not what's being said here. I'm sorry, but it's not what's being said here. So this is what the Aryan view is. Jesus is not Michael. Michael is not Jesus. They're two separate persons. And I think that the, the, the biggest and most powerful difference is when Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and Michael is going out and doing stuff for the Father. Shows that they're not the same because the Messiah is only to sit at the right hand of the Father while the Father takes care of business. And so I feel like that's irrefutable. So is it probable? No, it's not probable. Biblically, it's not. You can get into all of these other extra biblical books and, you know, what people have written. They're non-canonical. You can go with that if you want to, but according to the Bible, they're absolutely different. And that's the way we go. Arianism doesn't say that. Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Absolutely not. Hope you have a great week. Hope this kind of clarified the differences between Jehovah's Witnesses and Arians and um, that you guys get more clarity on the view of Arius and the Arians. Bye.